uh, we will talk a third to talk about uh, uh, the third lecture of the DNA sequencing. Uh, and uh, uh, so the topic today will be focusing on uh, variant identification. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier last, uh, uh, in the last lecture, that uh, there are two lectures devoted for the bioinformatics data processing for the DNA sequencing side. Uh, in addition to what we have talked about, uh, the sequencing alignment. So the first part will be the sequence mappability and the refined alignment. And then the quality recalibration on both the raw-based quality, as we talked about last uh, uh, lecture, and then we'll also talk about uh, uh, the, the variant quality recalibration uh, today. And then the third uh, uh, topic will be the variant identification from the BAM to, to variant files. Uh, just a, a little bit recap of the previous lecture, we talked about mappability, that we know that a human genome is very repetitive. Uh, actually, over 52% of human genome are in the repetitive elements regions. Uh, there are many different types of uh, repetitive elements, and those nine unique mapping can cause uh, a lot of analysis problem. So when we identify genetic variants that can cause the false positive, uh, when we look at uh, the quantification measures like RNA sequencing data or copy number variation, sometimes if we are not careful enough, we may uh, run into trouble. And then when we design the capture arrays, so we, can, we need to consider mappability in the, in the big deal. Uh, and also that mappability is uh, region specific and, and alignment algorithm specific. So those are the major topics we talked about last uh, lecture. And we also talk about uh, refined alignment. So this is something that uh, uh, we, we need to do that because of the presence of small insertion deletions, because this can cause uh, local misalignment. Uh, there are uh, the major uh, reason for this is uh, comparing to the initial alignment. Uh, uh, the initial alignment, the goal is to minimize the mismatches for one sequencing read. And uh, well, for the refined alignment, is we want to minimize the mismatches for multiple reads, all the reads in these regions. Uh, the way to do that, there's a two-step process. The first one is to identify the regions that could have uh, uh, issues that we need a, a refined alignment. And uh, so basically, it will be whether we have detected any sequencing race that has the insertion deletions in this region, or whether there's uh, several different uh, multiple mutations that were detected in this region, or there's a lot of disagreement after doing the alignment uh, in these regions. So once we identify those regions, we'll more focus on these regions to do the refined alignment. And to do the refined alignment, there are three steps. The first one is uh, we will first uh, enumerate all the potential haplotype candidates. Uh, and then the second one, we will do the gapless alignment on all the haplotypes. And then the last step is to calculate the likelihood of each haplotype. So anytime that we see increasing a novel haplotype will help us to increase the overall likelihood and that will be the, like, the, the haplotype we're going to pick. Okay, so you can see that here are uh, the results of uh, uh, one example that before sequence uh, refined alignment, you see there is a two, in, two rays we have identified the deletions, but there is a, a couple of those that looks like uh, um, there is uh, 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 SNPs in those regions, but after refined alignment, you can see those are caused by uh, the misalignment of uh, some of the rates, and those two um, uh, RS numbers or these two SNPs are false positives. Uh, and we also talk about uh, the base quality recalibration. The reason we need to that is uh, the base quality is reported by the sequencers. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, and for actually for most of the platforms, uh, the reported uh, uh, quality is not very accurate. As you can see from this figure, that uh, the purple dots are the ones that before we had a re uh, uh, recal uh, call it base quality recalibration. So you can see that uh, every single one of it uh, 
uh, the reported quality, quality is better than uh, the empirical quality, which means they, what they really are. Uh, and um, there are, uh, so these higher than empirical quality scores provide false confidence in the, in the base callings and, uh, and when we do the uh, alignment algorithm, when we do the variant calling, some of the algorithm use these uh, 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 base quality measures. So sometimes will cause us bigger trouble. Um, and uh, they can be uh, 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 conducted based on multiple covariates for each of the base. And uh, the ones that we introduced in the lecture include the reported quality and the positions inside the read. Is that in the first and beginning or middle or end of the read? Or, and also the sequencing content, which means uh, the, the dinucleotide, whether the previous nucleotide is A, C, G, or T. So those are all, all the 16 type of dinucleotide has been analyzed. And also there is a, a lot of others that can be added if needed as well. So, so in the GATK package, there are a few dozen of those covariates can be corrected. So you can see from the, this figure, which is uh, the, the blue dots, that uh, after the recalibration, the reported quality is becoming accurate, meaning they are in well aligned with the empirical quality. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. So the topic today is more focused on variant identification. So we have, so far we have discussed uh, uh, the FASTQ files and then do the sequence alignment and do the refined alignment and making sure that they are aligned correctly. But after doing that, how do we call the genetic variants out of it? Okay. So this is a, a question that initially I had. Why this is even issue? It's pretty straightforward, right? So you got a reference uh, here and then you got your sequence. Uh, and if uh, all the sequencing nucleotide supporting uh, alternative variant is different from the reference genome, you can consider this is, uh, okay, this is pretty much as a, a, a homozygous variant. So this sounds like a pretty simple. Okay, in this case, uh, this will be more on the heterozygous variant case. So you can see that half of the race, roughly half of the race, uh, is the same as uh, the reference genome, and then the other half is uh, different from the reference genome. In this case, it's, uh, it's pretty clear. It sounds, looks like uh, a heterozygous variant, okay? Um, but um, uh, sometimes it, it may not be that uh, straightforward. And uh, so, for example, if we see 10G, or there, this part has uh, 10 nucleotides, for example, if we see 10G and 0A, we pretty much are convinced uh, this is a, a homozygous variance, right? Because almost all the sequencing rates is different from uh, a reference genome, and they are very consistent. And, uh, but if we see 5G, 6A here, well, that is uh, pretty much look like a, a heterozygous variance. How about if I see 2G and 2, uh, 9G and 2As? 6G, 5A, probably still a heterozygous variance. 8G and 3As, 7 and 4. So the, the boundary become more and more uh, unclear. So in this case, we probably need some of the statistical measure to help us to determine whether this is a variant, and if it is, whether it's a heterozygous variant or homozygous variant. So there are multiple factors that we need to consider. The first one is the number of sequencing reads support each individual genotype. Okay? In this case, homozygous, it so will be G, and uh, so two genotypes will be G and A, and in this case, the same. And the second one is whether we can consider the base quality for each nucleotide, and, uh, and that can be also considered in the variant calling algorithm. And uh, how about alignment quality for each individual read? And uh, how about sequencing depths? That meaning that how many reads that we require to cover this one genomic location so that we can have enough confidence to call the, ver the genotype one way or the other. Um, whether there is a sequencing error related, machine related sequencing errors, 
And uh, the output for that, so those are the factors to be considered. But output of all this will be the probability of each genotype, A, 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 G, or G, G. So whether the, which genotype is, uh, it stands for the largest probability. So that's uh, what the statistical model is trying to help us with. Normally, what people do is uh, to use uh, something called a Bayesian approach. Uh, I think for most of the computation-oriented students, you know what the Bayesian approach is. But for the biologists, I'm just putting in here that you can uh, see whether it makes sense. So Bayesian inference is a, um, a method of statistical inference in which evidence is used to update uncertainty of parameters and predictions in the probability model. So basically, in normal case, ideally, we have a model. And then we can, based on the model, generate the data. And, uh, but in reality, when we do the analysis, we do not have the model. The model is something that we need to infer. We want to find out. In our case, the model for this variant will be whether it's AA or AG or GG, what the genotype will be. That is our model. And that is something we don't know yet. I mean, at least we probably know the model, but we don't know the parameters in the model. But we do have the data, which is the sequencing rates that coming out of one specific model. So the goal here is the opposite. It's based on the data, how much confidence I have this model, one specific model is correct. And if it is correct, what are the parameters associated to that particular model? So for the variant identification, again, that the model will be the genotype, which is AA, AG, or GG in this particular variant. And the data will be the sequencing reads. For this case, so you can see that uh, this part, the reference is A, and then almost every single nucleotide is G, right? And without using any fancy statistical model, we probably can derive something like this, that we say the chance of AA and AG is pretty low, and then it's more likely to be GG. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we, what we want to do is trying to figure out how to mathematically derive this out. Okay. So the equations can be complicated, but I will just give you the most simplified version of this. And once you consider more parameters in, it can be more complicated. So in this case, uh, we can think of uh, one particular genomic location have n sequencing rates. And there's a k rates to support A and n minus k rates to support G. Is that clear? That's uh, pretty simple, right? So now we have three possible genotypes. And the first one is AA, OK? And if the genotype is AA, so here is the trick. If the genotype, if you assume the model is correct, one particular model is correct, if the, the genotype is AA, and then if we observe the layout of the, the data like this, that means n minus k rays I did it, so it, it is an error, right? It's a sequencing error. So observing n minus k arrows, which is g, in n rays, what's the probability of that? And the, the probability probably is pretty small because that will be for those individual nucleotide locations, the base quality time together, right? Because that is how you represent whether the accuracy of those. Uh, those uh, uh, arrows, so you can see that uh, th those those nucleotides. Okay, so the second uh, uh, genotype, possible genotype, will be A G, and this will be a binomial model. So in theory, that we have half of the rays follow A, half follow G, because this is a, a deployed genome, right? In humans, that we have one chromosome coming from mom, one from dad. So we, we should have half a half in terms of our sequencing rates. So in this case, in theory, we should have half A rays and half G rays. And the probability that we observe K A's and N minus K G 
is following, will follow this particular binomial model. Does that make sense? Okay, so it will some, be something like this. Well, if the, the genotype is GG, and then if we observe the K raised support A, N minus K support G, that means we will have K rays that K arrows in N rays. So what's the probability, what's the likelihood of that? So, I mean, basically, you have different models here, which is the genotype. It's the probability to observe this type of uh, distribution of the sequencing rates, and uh, that will help you to calculate the probabilities. Okay, so let's put into uh, 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 a way that, uh, that uh, so the prior of the genotype, and uh, it's a probability of AA, is equal to probability of GG is equal to one minus R divided by two. So what is R? R is the probability having a heterozygous variance. So in this case, this is based on people's assumption, okay? And uh, so this is also called a prior in the Bayesian uh, framework. And as you, so you can see, if we define the, the probability of heterozygous variance, in this case is AG, is R, and then the probability of AA and GG will be one minus R divided by two, right? So that will add them up, will be, together will be one, okay? So this R is a predefined probability of observing heterozygous variance. And uh, normally what people do is uh, for known SNP low size, people will decide R as 0.2, and then for the unknown low size, and R will be very, very small, will be 0 0.001. So this is a, uh, just a, the initial variant calling algorithm is based on this type of setting. Uh, and, uh, and by the end of the day, for given your data and uh, the probability of one specific genotype will be calculated based on this uh, Bayesian rule, okay? So that is, uh, the way that they calculated this uh, uh, genetic variant information, okay? And then your variant quality will be, um, so the PD will be the probability, the PGD given D will be uh, the probability given, given the data we observe of one specific genotype, and then one minus this will be the chance that we made a mistake, and then the variant quality calculation will be based on this equation. Yes? So is this R of 0.2 and 0.001? Is this going to be determined? No, this is a, a very arbitrary determined initially. And uh, based on the people's experience on that. Uh, and uh, it's just uh, for known SNP low size, it will be 0 0.2. I mean, if, if this is a, a, a position that uh, you have seen the genetic variance in the dbSNP or, or in other database, you will give a higher chance that this is possible to be a, a variant location. And uh, if you haven't seen anything uh, difference in, in this particular base, you will give a much, much smaller uh, number. So since it's a known SMP size, shouldn't it be more? Well, so yeah, but but still, most of the variants are. I mean, even though there is a, a five percent of a chance that some people have the genetic variants, and for one specific individual, it, it probably is still not that big. So zero point two is already a pretty big number in this sense. Okay, so we'll get into the back to this point a little bit in the later slides. But I want to make sure that people are following this logic. Is there? Any questions? Or it's just so unclear that there's no questions can be asked. So there is an op opportunity for that as well, okay? Um, so, so, yes? So uh, this no, uh, the no R value is one, two. It's because uh, heterozygotes are fairly uncommon in the population? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's a, well, well, let's let's put it in this way, and uh, the the if yeah the 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 heterozygous variants are 
uh, much the, the probability, the percentage in the genome is much smaller than homozygous variants. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, just a, the way they decided to use this. Uh, so we will come back to this point, this R de determination. I mean, this is a, a common problem for Bayesian based approach that you will have to pick a prior information. And uh, in some of the cases, uh, the prior is determined based on your best knowledge, but if uh, it's wrong, and uh, that can impact your result as well. Uh, okay? But the, the general framework is based on the data and to go to determine which specific model is more appropriate. I, I'm just hoping this is, uh, is being clear. Okay? So there are some additional comments I want to make here. Uh, first of all, this method only works for deployed genome. Uh, and uh, as you can see that uh, there are three possible genotypes, AA, AG, or GG, right? And uh, so, so this is only for deployed genome. We, we have two, a pair of uh, uh, chromosomes, that one from mother, one from the father. And the second one is uh, this will require substantial coverage for each genomic loci. And uh, for every single nucleotide position, if you only have two read, you probably cannot do anything about it, right? So in most of the cases, uh, we will require our larger than 20x coverage. And uh, in our current standard, we normally require 30x coverage uh, by average, so some of the rates will be, half of the rates will have lower than 20, the 30x coverage. But you still want to, to push as many as a genomic location having more than 20 uh, reads that cover that particular location, okay? And again, this is uh, not always the case. So you say, okay, I'm going to sequence uh, 40x, uh, I'm going to sequence 50x, but keep in mind, the, the, the genomic sequencing across the genome sometimes are not that uniform. So even your average sequencing rate is 40x coverage. That doesn't mean most of every single base is 40x coverage. The chance is uh, there's only 20 to 30 percentage of the, the genomic region have lower than 20x coverage, even if you aim at 40x coverage. Okay. And uh, for low to moderate sequencing coverage, this will not work well. And uh, this will, uh, meaning that if we have only a few reads that cover one genomic location, sometimes we just don't have enough data to say there is a variant or there is not a variant. In this case, we will lead to undercalling heterozygous variants. This is more severe for the heterozygous variant locations. And uh, so one assumption that is being made here is the independence among the reads, which may be violated uh, for this approach, because we are assuming that every single nucleotide or read are being sequenced independently. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the variant, uh, uh, if there is a sequencing error, those are completely random errors. This assumption may not hold because there will be PCR specific errors, there are position specific errors, so that, that is a potential problem of this approach. Okay? Any question? Any questions so far? Okay. So this is uh, in general that, I mean, uh, the equations can get more complicated, uh, but this is the general approach that people are doing. But if you look at uh, coming back to this, and uh, one of the things that for this approach, and uh, a couple of students already asked that questions, one of the key elements in here is your R, which is uh, um, it's the, your probability of uh, observing a heterozygous variance. So you can see this R is equal to 0 0.2 for known SNP loci, and 0 0.001 for unknown low size, okay? Um, this R can actually be estimated from a larger population. So meaning that if I'm sequencing only one person, okay, and uh, I, I don't know this R, right? But if I already have the thousand genomes data, if I have many people's DNA sequence already there, and this R 
the probability observe uh, a heterozygous variance at known locations it can be determined at a population base when we lump so many people data together. So when so this will come to um, a, another improved approach to do the variant calling. So not only based on the previous model that I mentioned, but in this case that we will have some determination based on the uh, to the R based on the. The, the multiple individuals that in the group, okay? So the reason that people do that is, uh, we, if we look at the previous slide, one of the, the, the important uh, information is we need a substantial number of coverage for every single genomic loci. We need about 20 nucleotides or, I mean, 20 uh, uh, reads or 30 reads or 40 reads to cover that. But uh, so far at this stage, that we probably can achieve that pretty easily. But uh, a couple of years ago, when people start to do the, and the sequencing costs are still very, very expensive. I, I don't know how much you heard about that, but the initial phase of Southern Genomes Project, when they do the whole genome sequencing, the average coverage is, uh, do anybody know how much was that? Give a guess. It's only 4x coverage. So meaning that's what they can afford. For every genomic location, they can only have four reads to cover that, that loci. But this, in this case, if we bring it back to the previous model, and that we won't have enough statistical power to do anything. So here is what people did uh, in response to that. So they were trying to lump more information into this. Think about what we can lump into, okay? For each person, each location, we only have four nucleotides, uh, four reads to cover that. It's not much. But uh, the good news is uh, we are sequencing not only one individual, we are sequencing a thousand individuals at a time, right? So you can think of uh, this is a read of individual one, two, up to N, and then you have a genotype likelihood here, which uh, each individual one, you can have an estimation for this, okay? To see whether this part is a, a homozygous loci or, or heterozygous loci. With the acknowledgement that this is not very accurate yet, okay? So now you have, uh, after you're putting all this together, and because you have more individual data help you, you can estimate that R value more accurately, and then you can come back to update your model and to have a refined genotyping call for individual. And now you have a better genotyping call, you can estimate that R value more accurately. So this will become a joint across multiple samples iterative process. Does that make sense? Okay. So you started from only four sample, four read for each individual patient, but you have many of the patients. Initially, you have an initial estimation. Based on the initial estimation, you estimate the R, and then you come back to refine your model to have a refined genotyping call for each individual. And then you have a better R, and then you come back and iterate this again and again until the algorithm becomes stable so that uh, no improvement has been further made, okay? So this is, uh, I mean, the, the math part is uh, fairly complicated if you, you go to the initial paper. But the general idea here is uh, we, every time, if we want to improve the statistical power, we have to have some base for this. For this one, we, we, we don't have money to sequence a lot, but our statistical power will be increased by looking at uh, thousands of people, their genotype together, that is one way to increase the statistical power. And then they were doing this through updating those R values. So mathematical equations so is very, very complicated. A couple of pages in, in the manuscript, which I'm not capable of understanding anyways. So I will not try to interpret that. Another direction that we can think of increase the statistical power is uh, 
by lumping multiple genetic location together, right? So it, it, if you look at these two positions, they can be hundreds or thousands of space away from each other. In one location, this is a heterozygous, can be A or C. In another position, it can be G or A. But both of them are heterozygous variants. Okay? If we call them independently, and then in this location, there are only four rays. Okay, C, C, A, A. In this location, it's A, G, A, G. So, I mean, you start to have some indication they might be homozygous variants, but you are really not sure because uh, only four rays are covering that. But if we have the haplotype, we have the facing information. For example, we know, I mean, A and the G, they should be on the same allele. And the C and the A, they should be on the same allele. Suddenly, you are turning your eight read become as four rays, each position become eight rays because they can help you to further increase the statistical power. So this is the second way that people did to jointly analyze the variant of multiple locations that can help you to improve your, your variant calling capacity. Does that make sense? Okay? And that's why that uh, we'll get back to this uh, uh, in the later uh, slides as well. So the link the risk technology we discussed about last time, like 10x, will help with uh, the detection power. So you can see here in the linked arrays, I don't know how much you still remember about that, but uh, we started from a very high molecular weight DNA, 50,000 bases, and then you barcode each molecule, so, so, and then break them down to do the sequencing. So you know these two rays, they are coming from the same initial nucleotide, so they have to come from the same haplotype. And so is this one. So, this technology, by technology itself, will help you to generate this uh, heterozygous uh, inform. I mean, those uh, uh, haplotype information. But even without this, uh, and people are using other type of like a LD linkage disequilibrium block and help you to bring these uh, two things together. And uh, uh, Dr. Dongbing Lai, in next uh, lecture, will talk about uh, a little bit on the LD block and those type of theories. But generally, I hope you appreciate the fact that, that uh, forget about the equation. Okay? You don't have to forget about it because you don't know that anyways. Um, in order to improve the statistical power, we, so here's what I want you to understand. There are additional information required. There are two levels of information that we are putting together. One is borrowed information across multiple individuals through adjusting that R values. And the second one is by looking at multiple nucleotide positions on the genome, jointly calculating the call so that we can increase the statistical power. So here is the performance people did. So if you look at the this one here is a genotype call accuracy and the proportion of non calls. Forget about all this. But if you look at, uh, if we only look at one variant at a time, one individual at a time, so here is a statistical power. The, the genotyping call accuracy is uh, roughly lower. And then once you put the multiple sample together, so you can see it dramatically increased the overall accuracy. And then if you put this together with this Beagle, Beagle is a software package that people will estimate the haplotypes, bring the different locations together. So this has been superly dramatically increased. Okay? So these two levels of information will really help us to increase the accuracy of the, the, uh, the calling. Okay? Any question? Okay. I don't think we can finish the, the, this lecture. <laughs> okay, so the next topic, uh, I probably will move a little bit faster, which is uh, the variant quality recalibration. Okay. Um, so after variant identification, using the statistical theory that I mentioned earlier, we will 
identify a lot of variants. And uh, many of them are real, but some of them are wrong, are false. So how do we, how, how, what's the best way to identify the false ones so that making sure that what we calculate is, uh, is we identify is correct. So there are many different ways that uh, that these uh, false calling are generated. So first one is uh, the machine or chemistry artifacts, uh, including the sequencing cycles and uh, different chemistry versions, GC content, homopolymers, and sequencing bios, and so on and so forth. And another uh, possible cause will be our analysis flows flaws, like uh, we didn't do the alignment correctly, like if we didn't do the refined alignment for the indel positions, that is uh, another source of uh, inaccuracy. And, uh, and also that we need to realize that each variant has many different variables, including the variant quality that we estimated based on the previous uh, uh, method, the depth of, of the coverage, how many nucleotides that maybe raise that we have for this position whether there's a strand bias, whether all the variants are being identified in one strand, not in the other strand. So there are different uh, uh, descriptions of those. So there, let's look at uh, different variables and uh, to see that the ones that we are very confident that they are correct identifications and the, with the ones that we are not very confident. So we are seeing two different colors. One is the known SNPs. And the other one is normal, normal SNPs. I have to say here, the normal SNPs can be real. A lot of them are real, but there will also be a large percentage that is a, a false identification as well. So here is what they, they look at. They look at the known SNPs with one color and normal SNPs with different color. So you can see here are eight different measurements. They want to see whether there is a distributional differences between the known ones and the novel ones, okay? So you can see that in terms of the variant quality being identified, there is a huge difference. That makes sense, right? Hypotype scores, probably not too much difference. Extreme hardy weinberg violations, there's a, a strong differences. Strain bias, yes, there are more strain bias for the novel SNPs than the known SNPs. The depth of coverage, there is a little bit difference, not much. And uh, this is the root mean square of the mapping quality. So you can see there is a, a little difference, but overall shape, it looks the same. The mapping quality number look like this. So, but those are the ones that for these eight variables that they pick out, they want to look at whether there's a difference between the variants that we already known before and with the novel variants that, that people haven't, doesn't know. Clearly, some of these variables, there is difference. Is that clear for this point? Okay. So before we get into how to use this information and uh, before we use them, we need to find out, we need to have a way to retrieve the, this information. How do we get the variant quality? How do I get the hypotypes? How do I get the, 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 the depth of coverage and so on and so forth? But the good news is all the information or most of this information is already in the VCF file we talked about in the very early part of the, the, the lectures. Okay, so these are, after the initial variant calling, you generate the VCF files, and all, most of these measurements, the variable I'm showing you here, is already been in the VCF files. So for every single variant, it's fairly easy and straightforward to retrieve them, okay? So now we can get it, then how to use it, okay? So before we get into more, sophisticated statistical model, let's see if I'm doing this, how I'm going to use that, right? I would do the filtering, right? So some of them, I know that uh, um, variant quality, my Q20 score, and the, the, I mean, variant quality larger than 20, meaning that if uh, my variant quality for one specific location is less than 20, I'm going to filter it out, okay? And then, we will look at strand bias. So if there is a strand bias, I will go into filter it out. I will look at the sequencing depths. If it's a not, if it's a smaller than eight or ten or fifteen, 
whatever I feel comfortable, I will get rid of it. And then the mapping quality needs to be larger than 20. If the mapping quality of the, the of those regions are bad, I'm not going to use it. Okay? So I can be very smart, I can be very stringent or flexible in terms of selecting different parameters to do that. Right? So that flexibility is actually a problem because there are too many parameters and every single parameter I can set up a cutoff and that will become so arbitrary. Right? And nobody's result can reproduce anybody else's result because everybody will be using their most favorite filtering. And even when I'm doing it, if I'm not making good notes, I probably won't have a, a, a reproducible answer. So that is the problem. So the better approach to approach this is to assign not many, one well cal recalibrated -cal probability to each variant call in the call set. And one can then create a, a, this filtering by set up only one filtering based on this. So basically the point is using all those variables to summarize one value and then do the cutoff based on this value. So in that case, at least we have some base to deal with and at the same time that you don't have to be that arbitrary, it's still arbitrary, but you don't have to be th that arbitrary in terms of making those decisions. Okay, so do we, are we clear on the, the overall logic of this? Okay, so now let's see how to get to this uh, value. Okay, uh, the strategy here is, uh, okay, take a moment, think about that. If you do it, how you do it, okay? A lot of people here, again, we have uh, a lot of variants. Some of the variants we know they are real because uh, they have a higher chance to be real. They, have, they are known, okay? Some of the variants, they're novel, okay? Let's take a moment to think the novel ones are wrong ones or false positives. And for each variant, we have so many variables that we can derive out of the VCF files. How you are going to do that? Any potential answers for this? Anybody take took uh, Xiao Wen's machine learning course? So you have a positive training set, you have negative training set, you have so many variables. You can do some type of uh, feature selections, and then you can train a machine learning model, like for random forest or whatever model that you are comfortable with, and then you can form this model, right? Is that right? So you have positive training data set, negative training data set, and then you have a, a list of variables and do the machine learning. That's, that is a classical way of do it, to do it, okay? For our case, uh, you can potentially do that, but um, there is a, a small issue on that is uh, our positive data set is relatively well defined. So those are the ones that uh, we identify variants, we know they have seen, been seen before. They are in the DB snap, uh, it, we have a higher chance to say they are real, okay? Our novel ones, however, is a mixture of uh, sequencing errors or what type of uh, false positive identification being put out there with uh, a lot of variants that uh, is your private variants, they are correct identifications. So we, we wouldn't be able to use this machine learning approach, positive and negative training very effectively. So what people do is they only train on highly confident known sites to determine the probability that other sites are true, okay? So the way they do that is they only start from the confidence, the only the positive ones, the high confident known sites and going through all those different variables. And then they will derive a machine learning model only based on the positive ones, not based on negative ones. And then you have all the other variants and going through this machine will recalibrate one value on this. If I can imagine this in a one dimensional case, right? Only one variable, for example, you can look at uh, for example, let's go back to here. <clears throat> For example, I only based on this uh, 
variant quality. Okay, and then I will say, okay, in the known ones, the variant quality is bigger than the novel ones. Okay, so if I make the cutoff at here, for example, if I make the cutoff at here, so most of my known ones are being included, and only a very small proportion are not included. And then you can see that maybe if I cut it here, and then those are the potential false positives. Okay, but you can I mean what what they they are doing here is um, similar to that strategy, except for it looks on a higher dimensional structure. So it's not only one variant at a time; rather, it's uh, pulling all the variables together. And then the way they did that is. Uh, um, they use uh, something called a variational Bayesian Gaussian mixture model. And then, so here is the equations. Feel free to learn that. It sounds very interesting. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but, uh, but I think the point is clear. It's uh, you based on the positive data training set. And then you look at what is the most appropriate uh, um, distribution structure on that. And for all the outliers, you will consider them as a false. And only the ones that follow the, the original distribution, you will consider them, them as true. Okay? So let's see how the performance look like. And this is based on not multiple uh, dimensions, so only two dimensions. So X here is uh, the variant quality score. The higher the value is the more confident we are. This is a true variant. And the Y here is the evidence of the strand bias. I'm not going to go detail. But the point is uh, the higher the, the strand bias is uh, and uh, the higher chance this is, is, uh, is incorrect identification. So you can see that uh, from this, if we only look at uh, um, the dbSNP variants, or, or hypermap hyper variants. So those are the ones that uh, is your positive training data. Okay. So you will have uh, uh, two different clusters. One looks like a homozygous variants. The other one is heterozygous variants. And there are some ones that your variant quality score is pretty low, but at the same time your the, the, um, strand bias is pretty high. So all the indications supporting that these are not the true variants. Okay. So if you are able to identify that, opting, after using the model for the normal variants, and so here are the retained normal variants, the green ones, and then the purple ones are the ones that are being filtered. And you can see very clearly that why they are being filtered out, and they clearly are the false positives. Okay? So the variant recalibration successfully increased the also TITV ratio for the combined variants, and this seems to work well, and the variable can be added into the original list. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so let me lead you through about the variant call recalibration one more time in terms of the concept. And uh, the reason we want to do that is uh, for every single variant call, after we identify that, there will be uh, many variables associated to that. If I want to increase my confidence, uh, normally I would do for every single variable, like sequencing depth, strand bias, quality uh, cutoff, I would have uh, one threshold cut to that. This is too arbitrary, and the result will be not uh, reproducible. So the way to do that, they, they tend to, they try to identify one number that's summarizing all these variables. And then you can do the, your arbitrary selection based on the cutoff for that one number. And the, the way they do that, is they use this variational mixture Gaussian distribution. But in general, what they did is based on the ones, the variants they know they are true to figure out the distribution. And then for the remaining ones, they see what are the ones that fit into distribution. For the outliers that doesn't fit into distribution, I will get rid of it. So, so that is one number will give you an indication whether it fits this in, into this distribution or not. Okay? 
Any question? Are you ready for another quiz on this? No. Okay. Uh, the evaluation for the SNAP call quality. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, something that uh, after I did the variant identification, after I did a variant recalibration, now I'm looking at my data, whether I think uh, my data makes sense or not. Okay? So I will have some indication, right? For example, if I'm working on human whole exome sequencing data, I will expect uh, to identify about 30,000, 40,000 variants, okay? And uh, if you give me a million variants on the whole exome sequencing, I, wouldn't sure, I will not be sure whether you use the, the correct reference genome on this. It, you, you might were using the mouse genome. So, it, so, so basically, I want to have some of the general impression on this. And so you can see that uh, the first one is uh, the expected number of calls, the variance. So you can see from here is uh, if this is uh, for whole genome sequencing, if this is uh, for European individuals, or and, and uh, you're, you are expecting to have about 3.3 million SNPs. And uh, I mean, given or take a few hundred thousand, it really doesn't matter. But uh, you want to have uh, the number in this uh, scope. For the uh, African in, um, population, it will be a little bit more. The population is more diverse and uh, on the 4.3 million uh, variants. And then you can see that for exome sequencing, here are the expected numbers. And overall, if we are looking for 100 samples for European individual across the entire genome, you are roughly expecting about 30 million, 30 million SNPs. Okay, so those are just a rough estimation how variable we are and uh, whether your numbers are sounds right. Another level for uh, quality evaluation will be look at uh, the concordance with the genotype chip cause, and uh, and uh, the reason we are doing this is uh, for many of the samples that we are doing whole genome or whole exome sequencing. We probably have already did SNP array data before in the previous studies. Many of them we did. Uh, and then you want to see whether your previous uh, array calling and uh, it's agree with uh, the current ones. I mean, clearly that uh, sequencing based study will give you more variants, identify more variants, but at least for the ones that are being profiled on those SNP chips, you want to making sure they remain fair on uh, consistency. And uh, also that you want to estimate what fraction of SNPs are already known. Um, and uh, for single sample calls, normally we're expecting about 90% of, of, of the variants should be in the DB SNP. So if you, you see your numbers are much, much lower than this, and uh, and that there are something wrong with the, with the, the entire experiment. It could be um, because of the, the sample quality, it could be become sequencing quality or analysis issues. But roughly, you want to see around 90, a little bit over 90% of the variants are known before. And uh, you need to adjust your expectation when considering costs across different samples. And uh, we have talked about earlier that uh, transition transversion ratios, and this is a, a an important factor we need to consider about the overall quality. And uh, we know that uh, the transitions are uh, twice as frequent as, uh, as the transversions if uh, everything is uh, random. Uh, I, I mean, the tra transition transversion ratio, if everything is random, it should be 0 0.5, right? And then, but we know that for the human genomes, uh, uh, and uh, for the whole genome sequencing data, we are expecting about 2.1 ish for the transition transversion ratio, and for the whole exome re region uh, sequencing, the variant uh, transition transversion ratio should be 2.8 to 3.0. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a good uh, quality measure that when we revisit our data to see whether we are identified the correct things. Okay? Questions? Okay, so let's move on to the cancer somatic mutations. So what I have talked about 
uh, those uh, variant calling and uh, uh, variant call recalibration uh, strategies are all, all designed for diploid genomes, okay, for our germline genomes. So, so in our cells, we have a pair of chromosomes and then one from father, one from mother. So we have three choices. We have 0% of variance. We have roughly 50% of variance and we have 100% variance. So th these are the three possibilities. But uh, for cancer genome, and it depends on the purity of the tumor cells. And in many cases, in most of the cases, we will only identify a small proportion of the mutations that occurred. And uh, because uh, within a, a tumor, probably only a proportion of the cells are tumor cells and they did mutate, okay? And uh, for pool sequencing, this is different from somatic, but for pool sequencing, depends on the number of samples in the pool, only a fraction of variants are different from others. So you are not expecting 50-50% for the, for the heterozygous variant as well. If for our RNA sequencing, and then we might see two alleles, they express at different levels. So those are another issue that we may not uh, use the current model to do the variant identification based on the sequencing data. Okay, so just to give you one example, again, coming back to this artificial example, looking at this, I may have a different interpretation for this data. If I know this is a, a germline uh, DNA sequencing for a diploid genome, my conclusion probably this position is a homozygous variant that uh, reference is A, and this individual is G, and, uh, and uh, there is one nucleotide which is a sequencing error, okay? So if this is a, a diploid genome. If this is a, a cancer genome, and uh, based on the somatic tissue, and I probably will see, okay, so these are the G, and, uh, and this is, uh, could be coming from either a sequencing error or some of the, or the reference genome can be A, but uh, these are the mutations that are being mutated to G, okay, with a larger percentage of purity of the, the, the cancer tissues. If this is the put sequencing, I probably can see, okay, most of the individuals carry the G, and then their small proportion carry A. If this is the RNA sequencing, I probably can interpret this in the way that the G allele, this is a whole heterozygous variant, A and G, and the G allele express a lot compared to A allele. So you can see this can become very, very complicated, depends on your study design, okay? So this noon at lunch, a student asked me, um, not, not the students from here, uh, asked me that uh, I have some uh, DNA sequencing, I want to call variant, which software I should use? I said, I don't know. What, what's your experimental design? Is this a germline? Is that a cancer genome? Is that put sequencing? Is that, I don't know. Uh, if those will figure out, and then we can select the most appropriate uh, uh, methodology to do the analysis. Because, uh, I mean, based on the different study design, the, stat, the, the variant identification can be very different. Okay, now coming back to the, can, yes. The pooled sequencing? Okay, so let's say, I mean, of course, the number of reads needs to be more than this. So I cannot put too many there. But let's say I, I'm pulling 200, I mean, 10 individuals DNA together, okay? And then I'm seeing 95% or 97.5% are G, only one is A. And that means that uh, maybe, maybe nine people and they're homozygous G. And then one people is a homozygous, heterozygous G and A. 
So that's why I'm seeing about 95%, I'm talking about 10 individuals, which carries 20 alleles, and one out of the 20 alleles has a, this uh, is different from others. So, so I could see this type of false scenario. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why that you really need to know the study design, how your data coming from, so that you can run the analysis more uh, pro appropriately. For the cancer genome, there is a two type of uh, experimental design. The first one is uh, you have a pair of uh, somatic tissue and the germline. And then your goal here is really to identify potential variants using the tumor, uh, using the tumor samples, and then distinguish the difference between the tumor variants with the germline variants. Okay, because in cancer, what happens is your DNA is fine, but uh, the somatic tissue, because of the cancer, because of a certain level of mutations, some of this the positions that mutate to something else. So basically, you are, in a nutshell, you're looking for the differences between the germline and the somatic tissues. And that's why that uh, the analysis methodology can be very, very different, okay? And in some of the other study design, you can only have the scenario that you only have the somatic tissue. For example, often occurs in retrospective studies when old FLP tumor tissues are available, but there's no germline mutation, a germline sample that match with that, okay? So, so those are two study, type of study designs that people often do, okay? So the first one is uh, for the matched tumor normal variants, so you have both the tumor and the variant uh, normal uh, germline tissues, and then, so again, your goal is really trying to identify what are the differences between the germline somatic, muta somatic tissue and the, the germlines. There are two types of approach. I'm not going to go detail. The first one is called the heuristic approach. For this one, you really just start from the tumor sample, and then you identify the variants, and then you want to see whether the same variants has been observed in the in the um, um, germline samples. Okay, if they are being observed, and then you don't you don't further deal with that because they are not somatic t tumors. And uh, but the second way to do that is uh, to do the joint analysis by combining both uh, two sample types. So your your goal here is really to look for two different models. The first model is. Uh, here is uh, coming from the germline, and then what's the probability to identify all these rays, to observe all these rays in both somatic and the germline samples. And the second one is, uh, this is different between germline and the somatic, and then, so two models, and then you are looking at this uh, log likelihood ratios. Okay, and uh, the way to do that, there are many different algorithms. So the equation I'm, I, I put it here is uh, to use an uh, algorithm called the MUTAC, which is a part of the GATK package as well. Uh, in, in the GATK4, they do have a, a, a specific setting for somatic mutation identification, and, uh, and this will be the one set to be used. <clears throat> for the single sample variant coding, which means you only have somatic tissue, <clears throat> and you don't have a germline tissue. So in practice, uh, <coughs> matched normal samples are not always available, so variant call based only on tumor is, uh, is desired. And uh, some of the tools, like MUTAC2, uh, can be used on both tumor normal samples or single sample models. But the general strategy to do that is uh, you first identify the variants from the somatic tissue, when you only have the somatic tissue, okay? You identify the variants, and then you look at the features of those somatic variants, and then you want to classify which one is possible to be coming from the germline, which one are somatic, okay? And the way they do that is they will look at the membership of all different uh, uh, membership of the database of somatic mutations and germline mutations. They will look at the variant audio frequency, clinical impact on the mutations, the sequencing context. Again, 
using a machine learning based model to classify whether a mutation is a somatic or germline. So if you only have the germline situation, I mean the somatic situation. Um, the last part that uh, the third approach to do this is to use a, a UMI based of approach, which is uh, called a U unique molecular index based approach. So UMI is, you can consider this a molecular barcodes are attached to original DNA fragments. So you can see that uh, there are many different DNA fragments and each one has a barcode attached to it. Okay, so it's very unlikely that you are observing the same DNA sequence with the same barcode being attached across multiple samples, uh, uh, um, across multiple rays. So which means if you have 10 rays in this uh, scenario and they are all identical with the same DNA sequence with the same barcode, they are more likely coming from the PCR artifacts. Okay, so in this case, you will merge these samples into one because they are all coming from the, the PCR artifacts. And the second one, the group, as you can see, it carries a different uh, UMI barcode, and then they will also be merged into one. So basically, the UMI will help you to see which are the sequencing rates that are coming from an independent DNA fragments to begin with, so, or they are coming from the same DNA fragments, but being identified as multiple because of the PCR artifacts. And uh, by properly analyzing this data, you will also be able to identify the real variants in this molecule as well as the sequencing errors. So you can see from here that they carry the same UMI, same genomic location, and then you can see there is a variant that is very consistent across all the read. This is more likely to be the real variants on this uh, original DNA sequence. Well, so if you have only one of these carries a mutation, this is more likely to come from the PCR artifacts, right? Sometimes when you run the PCR multiple cycles, they will make a mistake or sequencing error. So after analyzing this jointly, you will be able to say, okay, here is the, the real DNA variance on this particular DNA sequence, okay? So the summary for this part is uh, there are many different methods to identify the variance. Uh, and uh, and uh, you, we need to be careful about what are the original biological questions, whether it's a diploid genome, is a put sequencing, cancer, RNA sequencing, because the analysis methodologies can be very different, okay? So I will stop here today, uh, and uh, next time will be Dr. Dongbin Lai talking about statistical genetics part. Uh, and then we will pick up after that. There's a, one more lecture I have for the variant prioritization, and I will probably use another 10 minutes before that to finish the, the structure variation part. Okay? Thank you very much.